Today, we're excited to have Sarah Ripley Forsyth with us all the way from South Africa. Sarah is the dynamic force behind a historic hotel and a vibrant game farm where her dedication to conservation and hospitality shines. Her leadership blends the rich heritage of South Africa with the untamed beauty of its wildlife. But to truly grasp the essence of who Sarah is, we must delve into her compelling social media presence. Through her post, Sarah invites us into her world, showcasing her daily engagements with nature, her conservation efforts, and the unique challenges she tackles. Her content just doesn't inform, it captivates and inspires. By offering a window into the heart of South African wildlife conservation, stay tuned as we uncover the layers of Sarah's life through her own narratives and experiences. Man, the ladder that comes out of the cattle rails is fucking awesome. No, no. the cattle, the ladder. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Oh. I don't like oh, the Make a 4 by 4 world. 4 by 4 world did they build 4 by 4 world. 4 by 4 world. What the fuck? Welcome to the Salt Lake Worldwide Podcast. This isn't just another hunting show. We're diving deep into the wild where nothing is off limits. Each week, we confront tough questions, explore controversial topics, and push the boundaries of adventure. From adrenaline pumping hunt and hard hitting conservation stories to the latest gear that can change the game, we're here to stir the pot and spark debate. If you're ready to face the unfiltered truth and get your pulse racing, you're in the right place. Buckle up, the adventure starts now. All right, everybody, welcome back to another Salt Lick Worldwide podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Miss Sarah Forsyth with us, coming to you live from South Africa. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Thanks for joining us. I know there's quite a bit of time difference, but we were able to make it work out. It's uh, afternoon time for you, but not so much for us. Yeah, morning time for you. Good. It's a good time for me. Good, 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 good. <laughs> Let's jump in. And if you could, uh, to kind of start off with, um, can you give us just a brief introduction of who you are, what you do, kind of like the, the, the Cliff Notes version of it? Cliff Notes, I guess it's kind of difficult, but yeah. guide me if I go astray. Um, sure. Well, I was, I was born into the hospitality industry, um, so of hotels, and uh, we, had, um, we had a game farm that was located in the northwest. So I think you, you guys kind of tend to call it a safari, um, like a, a, a privately owned game reserve. Um, so a safari for all intents and purposes. And we owned a safari with um, a lodge um, on it as well. And so it just sort of, the bush was always yeah. my passion. I grew up in the bush. Um, and so after hey. I studied and got a bit of work experience, uh, I headed over to manage this yeah. place and yeah. just been able to do a lot with, um, yeah, with, uh, hunting and conservation and, and the animal side of it. That's, that's my favorite. Um, so, yeah, that's what I do. I, I, I manage a, a hotel or we call it a lodge, but it's 66 bedrooms. So it's, um, it's a little big for a lodge. And it's called Kedar Heritage Lodge. It revolved around the history of South Africa. That's that. And, uh, yeah, that's that's what I manage, and I manage yeah. our game farm, and uh, we have uh, some other things close to the Joburg as well. So that's sort of that's sort of me, what I do. Yeah, you you're kind of all over the place, you know. I I first kind of ran into you on on social media on your TikTok, and then started following on Instagram and over on Facebook, and um, you kind of put I think. You just enjoy being there so much and doing what you do that it really shifts the content that you make. Thank you. Thank you. 
and, and there's there's going to be some questions about that too because there's some of that kooky stuff I see that I really want to dive into. Okay. <laughs> it, it's especially your boss. I guess it's a she, correct? Hundred yeah, percent she. Her name's Optimus. It's a- Optimus is the goddess <laughs> of the hunt. So yeah, in the wilderness. That, so I thought it was like perfect. Y'all know it. No, I I like it. Um, yeah, and then so like I said, uh, found you, kind of started following you on social media, and then um, watched your podcast with Dylan, and uh, you know, kind of kind of dove in there. I'm like, you know what, my I talked to Mike. I'm like, we really need to try to get her on the podcast. She was awesome, and in, in, in Dylan's and a little different audience, but you know, Mike and I were super passionate, not only about hunting and conservation, but really Africa in general, and especially South Africa. Um, I, I don't know how many, you know, safaris I've been on now, you know, kind of, a lot of times it gets a little bit of a bad rap from, from the States, you know, people hear Africa and instantly they've, they've got this idea. I want to call, call everybody watching in the States that we look at the States and we think the same thing right now. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, and that really, that's that that media problem, right? So you're especially in today's media, nobody just tells what's going on anymore. There's either a, a super leftist view or a super rightist view, and and there's no in between. The if you look at the news, you're looking at at yes. your um like more liberal news sources. Uh, what are they? What do you like? I don't know if Sky is or uh, like liberal media. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. MSNBC, CNN, yeah, all of those CNBC. Guys. And even your conservative news sources are all owned by the same major companies, right? You got like Blackguard and Vanguard owning both of those. So are their messages not going to be put through even if they're on different sides? You can still have the same general message. Scary. Yeah. It, like, it, I yeah, it, through the shit up watch somehow. So. Me, watch like that, as many yeah. different bits and pieces as you can. The only bits are lie, but at least you get like a bigger picture. Yeah, and like I said, I grew up in a at a time where you know reporters actually still reported the news, and I I kind of miss that now. But you know, like I said, so it's and you're right; they think the same thing here, especially with what's going on with Biden and Trump and everything right now. Our country turned into the freaking laughing stock of the entire story. world now. But we've gone through it, so you know, everybody gets their oh, shit. Oh yeah, hundred. Well, and you know, uh, your elections just went well for you guys, though. Yeah, it actually did. It actually did go well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that, and I saw the new ministers that were appointed, and I, I think maybe that at least I'm optimistic for things to move in a in a in a positive way moving forward. Just, I mean, the the new guy is head of like prisons. Like he's just amazing. He's busting all the prisons and giving everybody hell. It's quite exciting. Yeah, that's nice. I know the finally after all these years to get the ANC where they're they're not nearly the powerhouse that they used to be. Hundred percent. So, well, a bit of. Yeah, a bit of confidence, you know, maybe change is possible kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I get. So well, let, well, let's jump into it because we, we will run down a freaking rabbit hole. If <laughs> just keep going. We haven't even thought of <laughs> it. Don't... Yeah, so uh, I'll start with the first one. Mike and I are kind of go back and forth, ask you some questions, and then we'll see where they go. So um, you've managed to, to blend, uh, history, hospitality, and conservation at both the game farm and your hotel. Um, so could you share, you know, about how your personal background and the family legacy, especially have shaped your approach to, to managing these multifaceted enterprises? Hundred yeah. Um, well, I can't take any credit for it. You know, the qu- the question starts with, like, what have I? I haven't done anything. Um, it was all built by my dad and, and sort of set up that way, where he, he blended those things seamlessly. Um, conservation, he's always been super passionate about. Uh, and and with that, getting, like, game meat into the market, right? It's another, another form yeah. of conserving it. Um, and he just... And then he built the lodge, which worked hand in hand with the environment, and then you know, got the history theme going. And so it just seemed to work on and exactly. on. And, you know, and the bush feel is also good to explain the history. It's like a nice environment to, to yeah. learn about it. Um, and so he, he sort of put that all together and, and, and he shaped my philosophy. And so I hopefully yeah. will manage to pull it off. Yeah, and I see that with the hotel, too, and kind of doing some research, you know, after we talked and, you know, you do a lot with, especially from a historical aspect, um, with the with the statue program that you guys unveil every year. And, and you're not afraid to throw some controversial figures out there either. Hundred percent. You know, 
uh, somebody has for you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, these controversial figures, like if you don't talk about them, then you might as well just not talk about it because it would not be that way without them. That's why they're so controversial because they caused all that change. Um, so be it bad, be it good, and many of them were both bad and good from all the different sides. Um, and like, I don't know if I could say this, maybe you're gonna have to shut it, like take it out. But um, like Mahatma Gandhi, right? He was a crazy racist, if you read his, <laughs> his writing. So, so many people just look at him as a, as a good man, but he also didn't have things that people will be happy with, you know, that he had bad aspects to him. So all these characters, hey. You have to tell their the, the full story. Um, so yeah, it's and it's also fun, and people remember a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I go and I agree with you too. Well, I'm not, you know, we never shy away from controversy. At least Mike and I don't. But one thing I've learned going back and forth to your country is what we were taught in school about South Africa, and especially you know Nelson Mandela, for example. That's yeah. not exactly the whole truth. There's a different that's side to that story that that you don't learn in the states. Well, there's a different side to that story, and then also. <laughs> Like, now we look at, like, the time span, right? So, like, people will learn about, like, let me draw it. <laughs> um, if this is, like, the timeline of South Africa, right, you're learning about this little line of history, and that, that's what it is. You're not learning about anything that happened before then. And so you, you don't have any context. That's the issue. You focus on, like, what, like 60 years? And then everything else you ignore, and those hundreds of years are much more, um, well, they explain, and there's so much unity, and there's so much beauty in them, and, you know, and that's what I hope to teach you. I hope that I can bring in all these different cultures um, and tell all these different people's stories, and they can all learn why things happened, you know, what happened that caused these things, and that's the way we, that's why we are where we are today, you yeah. You are certainly passionate about it. I love it. For a little bit. I little love bit. it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. I love it. I can tell you so many stories. Actually, I have an awesome story for you. Do you have? Okay, hit me. Okay. Of course. Okay. So there was a war called the Anglo-Zulu War. It was the Zulu nation against the British, right? Because the British now were taking over Natal, that Zulu land region. And... Um, they were at war, this Anglo-Zulu war. It happened in 1879. And um, it lasted, I think, just a, it, just that year, if not a little bit less. And the Zulus just gave them such a run for their money um, that the, some of the stories are amazing. So um, the Anglo-Zulu war, I mean, the, the uh, yeah, Anglo-Zulu war was happening. And then Napoleon Bonaparte, right, like up in France, okay, now I moved to France. His son, um, they were exiled to England, right? So his son was exiled to England. He was called the Prince Imperial. And um, his, if he wanted to go and see this Anglo's in the war. He's a young man wants to go fight in the war, see what it's like. And uh, he wasn't allowed to go because he was first in exile and he wasn't a British citizen. And, but his mother was friends with the Queen. So he went to, she went to beg the Queen, can, can the Prince Imperial, can my son go and just, you know, observe this Anglo's in the war? Well, the Queen allowed it, and the Prince Imperial came to South Africa, to Zululand. He was 23 years old. He went out on a patrol he was not supposed to go out on, and he was captured and killed by Zulu. The Zulu nation ended any chance of a Napoleonic Empire's revival. Isn't that insane? That's crazy. Isn't that yeah. now? Yeah, and you don't, I mean, the, the implications of that would have been, I mean, that could have changed our history entirely. Under yeah, in theory, there should be a Zulu sitting on, you know, the, the, the head, of, head, of, <laughs> head of France. I mean, they, they just funny. be so amazing. Yeah, and I think I'm one of the weird ones, you know, I, I read a lot about South Africa, but I found an author in the last several years that was actually recommended to me in Wilbur Smith. I don't know if you're familiar or not. Yeah. Um, but... I've learned so much about the Boer Wars and Second Boer Wars and Zulu Wars and just on and on. And your country has such a rich history, and it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in reality, from from early colonization to now, your country's history is about as old as ours is too. Um, though there was, you know, Africa was in had prior to to when the states were, but you know, we had a, a tumultuous kind of history too in a short span. Yep. You know, within a couple hundred years, shit went sideways. Yeah.
were like everywhere in the world, right? Chinese killed the Tibetan people and like just everywhere in the world. Everybody always fought since the beginning of time, you know? Um, it's unfortunately human nature. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Mike, Mike, you want to jump? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's go to another so, subject, Mike. Yeah, we want to go a little bit toward conservation and, and calling and stuff. So what is your stance on calling as a responsible tool for wildlife management? It's like a non-negotiable, right? Like some things you have to do. You don't You don't have a choice. So, yeah, culling is a, a non-negotiable. You have to. You only get <clears throat> um, how far, how deep you want me to get into this. Get Well, it, frankly, this question came about because I saw a, a TikTok that you did yeah. when you were pissed off. Somebody, <laughs> I think... <laughs> A silly comment and, and so yeah, hit me with it because I think you you well, and like, I and Mike are on the I think we're going to be on the same page. Go well, like the same it. the same description, right? <clears throat> Which is like my it's my favorite uh, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So <clears throat> in South Africa, um, we have some private parks or, or we have a whole bunch of private parks and then we have national parks, right? Um, so sort of like the same concept that you guys do is you have national parks. Um, our national parks are very badly managed. Um, some of them don't have fencing in certain areas. Some of, <clears throat> and there's a lot of poaching in them. So like, for instance, sable antelope, right? In the Kruger National Park, which is three times the size of England, right? Here, they had, I think, less than 15 sable at one point. I mean, I, I basically have 15 sable on my farm. Um, and so we, we can't trust that animals can be preserved and looked after in those government parks, unfortunately. So the people who preserve South African wildlife, in all honesty, are private game farmers, right? So a private game farmer owns a piece of land and it's a finite piece of space. You only have so much land. <clears throat> every piece of land has what's called a carrying capacity. So your land can only hold so many animals. And it's everything backed by science. They, they tell you how much your land, you know, your capacity is, what kind of grazing you have, so how many animals you can have because of that grazing. It's very specific. Um, and obviously, nobody who has a game farm wants to take off more animals than they have to. You know, you want to keep your livestock. Um, and so when so breeding season comes along, let's say my carrying capacity is 500 animals. Every year, they give birth, breeding season comes along, now I have 700 animals. I have to take 200 animals off because my carrying capacity is 500 animals. Now, if I do not take them off, what happens? They get diseases, there's not enough food. Um, and so the entire population most likely all get sick or the majority of them die. Uh, and that is, you know, that it, it's just really stupid. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. You have to take off those animals. So now, how do you take them off, right? Because you have that finite piece of space and you're a private farmer, you have all those running costs. Okay. So now I have my electric fence that runs 365 days in the year. Forget about how expensive fencing is, uh, which is just unbelievable. Um, uh, I have to pay for all my vehicle, my fuel, my staff, bringing in more food, et cetera, et cetera, my electricity. Um, and so it's obviously a huge cost. How do you cover the cost of your game farm? You cover it through hunting. Like in, you know, in, in totality, pretty much you cover it through hunting, you cover it through culling. Most people use hunting as a form to cull, right? That's also a big thing. Um, and so, yeah, you have to take off a few for the benefit of, of the many. Now, why wouldn't I just uh, be a nice person? Say I didn't need, besides the fact that I need the money for culling, selling the meat or hunters coming in and culling, um, I, why don't I just, you know, send the animals off to some happy place so they can live with bunnies and dogs around with unicorns? Uh, it would be an expense that I couldn't carry because people don't understand the, the cost that you carry to transport something somewhere. Um, then you give it to somebody. And if they, in theory, don't have enough money to buy their own animals, how do they have enough money to look after their animals? So, 
yeah, that's that's sort of sort of the gist of it is that it's a necessity. And there is honestly, I have to tell you, like I think I firmly believe in it, is that um the future of South African wildlife will not survive without American like international you guys are like you're you're out safety card. You you I don't think you understand how much you protect our animals. You know, it's um it's actually quite something. And so I get I get incredibly angry at, at the green here because they, they're just killing everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're the murderers. They're the <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, for, for people that are seemingly, you know, intelligent and have degrees and, and may have all these accolades, they're the dumbest smart people you've ever met in your life when it comes to wildlife <laughs> conservation. Sorry. And they, they, they can't, for whatever reason, understand that, you know, the land has a carrying capacity, like you say, right. and it's, and it gets expensive. You know, you, you can't continue to feed and house all these animals. It's oh. bad for the land too. It, bad for the soil and everything else and we actually uh mike and i actually uh participated in a call hunt this year um in the eastern cape near tarka uh 66 000 acres of free range farm and there were there's spring buck there's blessed buck there's impala there's fallow deer there's hog deer on and on and on and it's an active sheep and cattle farm so in order to you know to, to keep the numbers in check so yep. you don't overrouse the land for the cattle and sheep we've got a call yeah. And we did, we actually shot an episode that's going to air later this season. And, um, you know, originally I knew I couldn't sell it as a hunt, uh, right to our audience that I needed to sell it for exactly what it was. And, and that was that, Hey, we're, we're going to do a job. Um, and you know, our job is we have to take, you know, 50 spring buck, you know, or a hundred spring buck or whatever. And, and we're going to go do that. Now, while it can be enjoyable to get some trigger time, you're still out there to do a job. Yeah. And, and I think when people, get emotional about it is is where they you know where, where it starts getting sideways when they uh, let emotions get in the way it's no different and, the, and the, these greenies too they don't understand most of them eat meat where do they think that shit comes from right. you explain to me now you're eating a cow um that has been fed in a feedlot its whole life never experienced green grass running around being free stuffed with chemicals and then just slaughtered terribly and there we go it's put in it's put in a package and you buy it but then there's an animal that's been running around for years. It's so lean. It's so healthy. It's never had any chemicals put in it. And it's living the very best life. You don't shoot them when you, they're young. You shoot them when they're old. I mean, even when you start talking about hunting for trophies, right? And I'm going slightly out. But, like, you, when people hunt for trophies, those are often older, older males. Like, they, they've lived an amazing life to get to the size that they are, in theory, you know? So... Yeah. Well, and that's in where, where you just touched on. That's exactly how I explain it to people, too. Um, I look at like a, a captive giraffe in the U.S. that's um, essentially in a zoo in a small paddock and they spend their entire life there. Is that better than than, you know, I I took a mature bull last year that was 26, 27 ish years old. It was pre planned out for a year. It was the initial bull that was brought into this game farm. Um, they were, they have a horrible giraffe problem now because there's this stigmatism about a giraffe, and a lot of US hunters just don't want to hunt them anymore. So they're, they're having a trouble with the giraffe. And, and so we had a problem bull. It wasn't necessarily a problem bull. He was super old. They were starting to inbreed. You know, they wanted to get, you know, some of the younger bulls a chance to breed. Yeah. And, you know, so we did it. Yeah. Well, not just that draft, but all the drafts. And, you know, it, it, so for me, it was an opportunity for me. I'd always wanted to kind of hunt a draft, but it, it needed to, to have a meaning behind it kind of thing. And, and that one did. And we set it up months in advance and we spent, I think we, we cut the video. It was like an hour and 30 minutes. And of that hour and 30 minutes, there might've been two and a half or three minutes of the actual hunt. And the rest of it was uh, interviewing the, the arbiter, the the farm owner, the the outfitter, everything, and talking about the conservation. Pro and, and we did a ton of drone and we air, you know, aerials of, of what these giraffes were doing because of over browsing and it, it's super important. But that giraffe got to live at its at life, nearly 30 year lifespan on several thousand hectares of land with one fence around it and was taken care of, never had to worry about anything. Would you rather live like that or in a cage for your entire life? 100%. And I don't think these people, for whatever reason, they just don't get it. They want to go and pet them and feed them there. And they think that's the, that those animals enjoy that shit. No, they don't. You it's like, local. I don't want to. No. no. I mean, they're happy to eat a chicken that's fully grown in 21 days. 
Right. Win. 100%. Incredible. Love it. Yeah, yeah. So you um you mentioned uh and and I jump back and forth like crazy, but as these things come up. So when I was watching you on Dylan's podcast, you have a you've got a big wetland that runs through your property, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I've seen on your videos too, and there's you know out there in the little boat dragging animals back and forth and doing some other stuff. But you know, so the you also mentioned about mining operations on adjacent properties too. So what are the most significant challenges you face from a conservation standpoint and and navigating this this dichotomy of both, you know, you've got this mining operation that that threatens the ecosystem and the ecological balance that you've kind of maintained 100%. or created over these years. And, and how do you how do you fight that? And, and, and how do you, you know, how do you combat that? Hundred percent. It's amazing how many challenges somebody can have. You know how many challenges God can throw one's way. Um, so this area historically has been a yeah, I think it's the biggest platinum deposit in South Africa. And um, now there's a chrome belt, you know, belts of chrome that's sort of the last in the area. And so these um, these people are coming to, you know, um, abuse the land. Um, and all going to China. So these big Chinese guys are coming in and using some little local people who have a PO box registered in like, you know, a neighborhood somewhere. Um, and they're basically just giving the minerals straight to China. Um, I heard something very beautiful the other day, right? We know, especially as like people who love conservation and animals, like how incredible God's creation is, right? So like how everything is perfectly balanced. And this insect does this, and this tree does this, and this, 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 this. Everything, like so many things have a mutualistic or symbiotic relationship. And somebody said to me, what do you think pulling all these minerals is going to do to the balance that God put in place in the ground? Isn't that an unbelievable thought? Is like, actually, what are we doing? You're, yeah. no, you're, you're, raping, you're raping the land is what you're doing. You know, I was going to say I've, that word before, and instead I said abuse because I was just worried about Americans being touched. Yeah, I mean, that's it is. No, that's it, exactly what's happening. 100% that there's no better way that you could put it. Um, and so we have um, we have a farm, and then, you know, it's so nice to have some of those farms that are like a three-hour drive from anything where you're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, but we were not out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And so they're coming for like all our boundaries. I wish I could, I'll send you a map just for your interest that we had about 14 applications in less than a two year period. And they're all connected to our property. Now the reason is, is because of the wetland. So when you have a spring or a source of water that starts on a property, that, that's rich ground, you know, that's, there's something in there. And like, even if you drive on my property, it's it's not an unbelievably huge area, but within it is four different kinds of sand. And like, it's incredible. And that's why that they're after that because, the, you know, the minerals are like, yeah. And it's scary. So legally in South Africa, you can apply to mine on any person's land and they just have to ha have a big enough argument to like, like the person, you know, the, the landowner would have to have a big enough argument to be the people who are applying, but often, you know, with, with corruption and what happens, people don't have a say. We, I'm blessed. Like, there's not, they can't go any other way but a good way. I refuse for it not to. But uh, we've been fighting. <laughs> we've, got, <laughs> we've got four of them to drop their um, applications, which is insane. My mother is an iconic woman. She just hands people their asses. It's incredible. Um, I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, she's so cool. She's, like, so cool. So cool. Um, so we just got a few more to fight and we'll keep fighting. I try to look at it as like a David Burke's, Burke's Goliath situation, you know, and all things come together for good. And this place is just too special to, to lose. Um, this wetland is really, really special. And it's one of only three peat wetlands, which is like a type of soil, left in this province. It is unbelievable. It's so beautiful. And 
what? They're going to come rip it out, send all those minerals to China. Nobody's going to know what a wetland looks like in 100 years. So I've been engaging with some people to try um, and get this declared as a private nature reserve and then hopefully get a buffer zone because the mining is really damaging us. The biggest concern, there's a few, there's two. The main one is they're sucking the water out of the wetland, right? Because they got to go get this crumb. Then they got to go wash this crumb. They need water to wash it. They're, they're, they're sucking it. Um, and it's scary. And then uh, at least the spring always runs, but it's scary. And then... Sarah, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but it, it, it telling me you have an incoming call and it stopped your recording temporarily. There, there you, you are. <laughs> Yahtzee. Sorry about that. <clears throat> no worries. Technology, technology is a wonderful Wonder thing, isn't it? <laughs> it is a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing. But uh, it works. <laughs> so I was, at, I was at wetland, right? Hundreds. Yes. Hundreds. Okay. All right. Okay. Huge crack through the property. Um, and so it obviously also impacts my buildings, etc. So it's a bit of a, yeah, it's a thorn in the foot. Is there, is there a possibility of any sort of, and I know you touched on it briefly, but in the States, what we would use to combat that is to put the land into a conservation easement. Is that, do you have something similar to that there? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm trying to be declared a private nature reserve, and that's the a nature reserve is the highest standard that you can have in terms of protection. And then, I, then after that, I want to get a buffer zone of like five kilometers, two kilometers, just to protect us a little bit. Um, I mean, we're we're it that's left in the area. Everything has been mined and destroyed, and going into those bloody electric vehicles is wrong. Don't get me don't get me started on that shit. Uh, I have a very very strong opinion of, about that. Of, me too. Um, they're gonna control everybody, lock them in, and drive them away to some crazy place. Now I love conspiracies. Maybe they'll drive them away from you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So they're just battles that you know got to face every other day. It's, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's kind of what it is. We will conquer. Yeah, right. So, all right, here's, here's kind of a, here's a touchy subject for you. So as a, you know, as a female in a predominantly male industry, and I'm sure you knew this question was coming, um, what's your, what's your perspective or something unique that you think you bring to the, to the table? And then secondly, how do you address the challenges and, and leverage those opportunities to, to influence the industry in a positive fashion? The challenges of being Do you get any slack? Do you get a bunch of grief for being a female in your industry? Hundred <sighs> percent. It's such a. I know I'm going to be asked this question for the rest of my life. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully not. Hopefully, in the next ten years, the, the things have changed enough where it, it doesn't have to be asked anymore. It's just accepted well, practice. You know, the thing is, is that like it's just really like not important. Like I'm just like anybody else. You know. I really honestly promise you my balls hang on the floor. Like, like it, it, it doesn't, it, it yeah, it, you know, it doesn't really make a difference, I think. Um, maybe how it would help in some kind of way is just another face coming on and talking about our industry that's just, like, kind of different and it's a girl, you know. Um, or I guess I'm a woman. I'm not really a child anymore, hey. Um, right. I guess so. Uh, so, yeah, but I've never, well, I've, yeah. Well, splintering from that then, I mean, so you're one of many women now that are kind of taking that path and involved in not only, not only animal husbandry, but, you know, hunting and conservation and, and a proponent for it. So obviously there, there's going to be a group of young women that look up to you and aspire to be like you because you're kind of, you're, you're, you're paving the way for them and making it, you know, so, Hey, there's somebody else that's doing it. Even, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. I mean, what's that feel like? Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> I hope eventually there'll be even, even some boys who say that, you know, um, as well. It's, the only thing that's scary about that is you just you just hope you always say the right thing because people are watching, you know, and you want to give them the best kind of information that you can. I I guess I guess to to think about 
maybe being somebody who might inspire that is, is yeah, it's purposeful, you know? So how do you feel about being a role model? Um, 100%. <laughs> pressure, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think, um, and I think it's probably constant through life. You're always trying to learn things and figure it out. You know, I definitely don't know everything. And the more I know, the more I know that, that I really don't know anything. Um, so there's too much to know in this world. Um, so that's why it's also important to have people around you that you can ask for advice and people who support you. But <clears throat> I suppose I'll talk a little bit about the female thing. Um, so I don't really see any just general difference, <laughs> but um, there are challenges, I suppose. I think that people, um, if you don't know your shit and you're a female, but also anybody, you just might be taken more advantage of in terms of what people are gonna charge or, you know, <clears throat> that they just might think that, that they can give you a hard time and give you less. Um, or charge you more, or talk nonsense to you. But as long as you have prepared yourself and you know that, you know, I, I say that if I can, if there's a female and a male working for a huge company and the female can bring in more money than the male, you're going to hire the female. You know, if, if it's the other way around, it's the other way around. It's based on a meritocracy. No business owner in their right mind is going to not employ that female because she's bringing him in more money or she's doing more work. Or, you know, um, but the only thing that's tough is uh, the objectification, I think. Right. Um, but as I've said previously um, in other things, is that that will happen in anything you're in ever in your life. You know, um, it's not just going to be focused here. So we also have to remember that. Um, so it's the, that's the only thing is sometimes you just want to do business and have a normal conversation and not feel like you're being pried upon, if I can say it like that. Um, mm -hmm. and so like, you'll always see me in all my videos, like fully clothed. My, my shoulders don't show, my legs don't show. I mostly have glasses that cover half my face, like, <laughs> because it's just, um, Yeah. That's the only pretty, well, that's the only sucky thing about being a woman, I think. Yeah, well, and here's the thing. I'm going to, and I'm going to catch shit for this next comment because what you just said was, was exactly spot on. So there is, and we're seeing it in the States, there is this huge influx of, of women hunters and women influencers now. And there are some that are doing it the right way like you. And there are some that are using their body to gain exposure. And in my experience, the ones that I've met now, they don't hunt for shit. They don't know anything about it. They are literally after likes. That's what they're shopping for. Um, and that, that's the, I think that's really bad. So that's counterproductive to what we needed as, as a hunting industry and for, you know, integration into the hunting industry by females, especially. Listen, I love to hunt. Some of the best hunts I've ever had were with women and I had a great time, but the, the, I, I think there's a group of people that, that, especially women and men are guilty too, that use their body, you know, for clicks and likes. And they're they're Those people are not good for the industry. Uh, there are some of them that can actually hunt and fish and that are decent at it. But the vast majority of it, you know, they've got these outdoor channels and they're wearing a bikini mowing their yard. That's, that's yeah. the whole premise of their YouTube show. Well, that's what, the hell does that's that what sells, right? That's what sells. That's what people are going to like. So that's what they do. It's, right. it's not good for us at all. It's not good for us, no. but it's, it's, no. it's totally the world that we're we're in. It's not going anywhere. I think that's why, you know, what kind of drew me to you so much is you're just like, you're always laughing and having a good time and you're not afraid to get out there and chase a snake and, and, and do what needs to be done. And, you know, I see you doing game captures and game releases and getting your hands dirty. And you it's just like one of the boys out there, but you, you, you just always have a smile on your face and even your some of your outtake reels it looks like when mike and i are filming something like our blooper reels are the funniest shit in the world out of the back because, it's so good. 
So good, but yeah. So that's that was my little quip there at the. And like I said, I'm gonna definitely catch shit about that here in the states. And you know, if somebody's gonna throw stones back at our back at us, but I'm I think it's you know those. Yeah, I don't care. Um, in fact, I I encourage it, and then I'll ask them to come on the podcast or, or let's let's debate it. And they always say no, I don't want to do that. Hundred yeah, yeah, big shoulders. Yeah, yeah. Hundred. So and then. Oh yeah. Um, so given the misconceptions, okay, so let's go back to hunting and conservation. So given the misconceptions that surround hunting and how hunting can be used as a tool for conservation, how do you educate people um, uh, about the ecological and, and ethical foundations for hunting as a tool for conservation? How do you do that? Yeah. So pretty much a little bit more fleshed out version of what I just told you guys you know, about the carrying capacity. And so so that's, and, I, and there has not been one time I haven't explained it besides right now that I haven't drawn it out for the person. Um, and so that's, and I, maybe I've had one person ever that has refused to agree with me. Um, so I, I think that when you, when you sit down and you have a discussion with, you know, these people of how it works and that, that there is actually no other way to do it. They, they start to understand. Most of them at the end of it say, I understand. I probably wouldn't do it, but I understand. Um, but yeah. It is. We, we did a podcast with uh, Doug Cocroft from Splitting Image. And Doug's so, also super yeah. passionate. Yeah, he's super passionate about conservation. And, you know, to him, there's, there's three types of people, right? There's the hunter, there's your non-hunter, and there's your anti-hunter. And I think he explained it really well in that, you know, uh, he has no problem with, with non-hunters so long as that was based on education and they were given the decision. The problem with anti-hunters is they don't listen to the data, they don't believe what anybody tells them, and they just go on these wild rants and tangents and turn into keyboard warriors and, just, and yeah. you know, so, so there's... You know, and, and that's hard to contend with, right? You know, we, we deal with it all the time. We get negative comments on, on hunting videos and other stuff we do. And the, I try to encourage people to, if somebody leaves a comment for us, I'm going to respond no matter what. And I, I try to get them involved in the conversation and, and at least educate them. I don't think I've ever been successful, you know, turning an anti-hunter into at least a non-hunter. You know, that would be perfect, right? Actually, in a perfect world, I could, I could turn an anti-hunter into a hunter. That would be the cat's ass. I don't think I'll ever get there, but we still try. And, and it's, it's tough even here, you know, in the States, it's bad. I think you guys get a little more over there because hunting is such a big part of your culture. Yeah. Um, you know, and it is here too, but it's just, I don't know. It's, it just uh, works a little different here. Um, unless hunting somebody life over there, you know, I mean, it's a little yeah. different here. Just well, yeah. but for, for us, the way we grew up, we grew up hunting, right? We grew up fishing. We grew up, our, our parents, you know, started us at a young age and that's all we've ever known. So to not be involved in hunting or fishing, I don't understand it. Right. So I, my mind doesn't work that way. And I can't figure out why people wouldn't want to do it. Um, what the hell would I, you do if there wasn't hunting and fishing? Uh, you casino? Know? Be a lot more crowd. Um, let's see. So, the, and there's a there's a bunch of good stuff in here. Um, all right, here's a good one for you. So, uh, where do you see the hunting industry in South Africa in the next decade? Hundred. <clears throat> um, you know, I I was thinking about this. Um that because America has become so liberalized, I really worry that they're not going to be a lot of hunters. <laughs> what do you guys think? You think there are going to be as many hunters coming out or? It's I can tell you we are sitting on pins and needles right now, hoping that Trump gets reelected um, because yeah, we really can't afford to have another four years of what we've just been through. Um, our economy's in shambles. Interest rates are ridiculous. It just, it sucks. And they've, they've opened the door for, and I don't want, I mean, there's so many things that are wrong right now and that the left has kind of let in. And, and that, those are a lot of those conversations. I mean, I can go into the, down the transgender route and this and that and everything else. And I have a really hard time with all that shit. But I think in order for, Trump can fix it, right? So he did it before. He can absolutely do it again. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, 
if he gets a chance. But you know what? As soon as he does, the next four years are going to be great. And I'm and I'm hoping that there there are some young up and coming Republicans in the states that would make very good presidents, and that you know they they're all about conservation and hunting and funding those programs and and stuff like that. So so long as the economy is good for the U.S. right, and and we're making money and and our tax uh, tax burden is much less. We have expendable income or disposable income that we can use to go over there. Yeah, and I'm not alone. I mean, small businesses have been hit. I've, I've talked to a lot of – I'm one of the few people that, that are fortunate enough to be able to go to Africa every single year. And I normally stay. You know, this trip I was there for seven weeks, and I love it. Um, most people don't do that. You know, they come every other year kind of thing or every third year. But if, the, if our government stays the way it is – People aren't going to be able to afford to do that. I mean, it's it's already difficult now, especially with interest rates the way they are. And we've also got this giant inflation problem in the states. And, it, and it's caused because of its unemployment, its interest rates, it's all this other stuff. And inflation is sky high right now. So because inflation's there, cost of living is also up there. It's really difficult. People don't have that disposable income that they used to, um, especially that, that median income family, you know, that – that blue collar worker in his family who's always dreamed about going to Africa and, and putting money aside. Well, those, you know, those funds that he would use to go do that are all of a sudden not available. They're spending more, you know, fuels a, a yeah, dollar and a half yeah. higher than it was when Trump was in office. I mean, there's all these other expenses now. And unfortunately, the left, I think the, the leftist movement here in the States, it, it looks more like socialism than it's it does democracy. For sure. 100%. And I think that's and I think that's where it's going. Um, we we but, do. I mean, as it's a even worse than socialism. It's like it, it's in terms of the like morality of where people are going. You know, like yeah. it's just it's so bad, so bad. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's it's. Listen, I, you know, I'm I'm fortunate in that I've got had the ability to travel all over the world, though, and. To, when you come to the states, it's still probably one of the safest places you can come to, and yeah. there are some. Apps. You know, you've been here, right? You, you went to school. Things work well. You know, majority of things work well. It's the it's the it's the liberalism that's the problem. It's what's coming in. Sure. It's the transgenderism. It's that's the part that's like, hey guys, are we going too far here. We need we need some help. Well, listen, I tough love is what we need. I live in Florida and. I stay there unless I have to go to a city. So I live way out in the country. My business is way out. I'd be mean, thanks to, you know, well, frankly, it's because of technology. I don't have to be located in the city to do what I do anymore. So, you know, I hate it when I have a job in Miami or I have a job in Orlando or Tampa or a place like that. I hate big cities, New York City, Chicago, Detroit. I hate them with a passion. You go, you know, 30 minutes outside the city and then you get into rural farmland and agriculture. And I feel like those are my people then, right? I'm, I know yeah. I can have a conversation with those guys and, and we can, even if we don't see eye to eye on something, we can at least talk about it. You get into these cities with these liberals, there's no talking to these people. You you can't even, they won't, they don't rationalize. They'd rather, as soon as something doesn't go their way, they're going to yell, scream and holler, throw themselves down on the floor and throw a temper tantrum like a, like a baby. That's what they're going to do. Yeah. That's what they do. I'm in agreement. We, we were supposed to talk about you in this podcast, and here we go into to, to politics on this day. Oh, so. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. But but back on the sort of the, the 10 year sort of goal, I, I well, where the hunting industry is going, <clears throat> with hopefully the government improving and circumstances improving there'll only be more game farms and more animals bred. Um, that's that's what I hope for. And then I hope more international clients coming out and hunting. Um, and then, obviously, certain species, it would be great to have them, um, you know, looked after, like rhino. Like, it would be great to have more rhino farmed. Because, for instance, I was at an auction the other day, and, like, one of the biggest auctions in the country – um, where Impala was selling for over a hundred thousand rand, and you a, uh, I saw you got a. Did I see you release a new Ram? Or you picked up a new Ram? I did. Yeah. Um, but like, he wasn't a hundred thousand though. He was a bit less. So just give me give me some space. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, there were two rhinos on that auction. There was there were two females and two calves, um, and. They a mother and a calf didn't go for more than a hundred thousand rand. Nobody, nobody is buying them. 
they because obviously the rhino horn is not um, legal to sell. So obviously that's a whole conversation of legalizing rhino horn in order to protect the rhinos. Um, so it was just it was so sad to see um, that the rhinos like weren't even being sold on auction because nobody can afford to keep them. They require a twenty four hour security team to look after them. You can't you can't afford it. Now can you imagine taking the hunters? like stopping hunters coming for the person who's trying to run the game farm who can't even afford to keep the security running for rhinos. You know what I mean? So would be that would be really amazing. Um, yeah, just recovering some species that, that were a bit more rare, which the private game industry has done with Sable, with Rowan. I mean, they, in the past few years, and all those boys who've been breeding them get their money from hunters. All of them. What? Well, I was finally able to hunt a bonobuck finally this year. After You're all seen. these years, of it, I, I was finally able to, to hunt one and be able to export it. And it, it was just, it's something I've always wanted to do. You know, I've hunted, you know, every color phase of less buck, but a bonobuck, I, like I've driven by them and I've seen them and it just drove me crazy that all these other countries can export them. But for whatever reason, we couldn't bring them back to the States. And now as soon as I found it, like I didn't even know ahead of time, I was in country when I found out. And, um, you know, I, I actually I just come up in conversation. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You can export them. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. We've got to do all this testing and this genetic testing. And there's a stack of paperwork like this, but you can absolutely hunt them. I'm like, and there, and how many do you have on quota this year? And he's like, I've only got three. That's, we've got paperwork to do three. That's all we're going to get. I'm like, I, I almost wanted to say, I don't care how much it is. I'm, I'm hunting them. But, um, but I did. So I was able to hunt um, a bonobuck finally, beautiful animal, and you know, it was really satisfying. And I can, you know, one day add him, had him to the collection. But those are, you know, kind of the success stories. And then you go back to, you know, was it, the, the, was it blue wildebeest that was nearly extinct or black? I always get them backwards. Maybe it was black. Black. But I don't um, know. I didn't know about the wildebeest. Yeah. The... Yeah. Uh, and that was a huge success story. At one point in, in time, I mean, there was less that's than exactly it. hundred or something left in South Africa, and now there's tens of thousands, if if not hundreds of thousands, of wildebeest. If if we didn't have these farmers, game farmers, or safari park owners that survive off of international hunting to breed these species back, they wouldn't be here. I wanted to tell you a a story. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, it's back to sort of culling and I, I've, I've mentioned it in one of my TikTok videos but I think it's so important and it's pretty controversial as well right so it's about culling elephant um, so elephant is an extremely touchy subject because they're emotional animals they mourn they're dead they're so clever you know uh, an elephant is it's a heavy thing on your heart to to kill <laughs> for lack of a better word um, and there's this park in Kenya called Tsovo National Park, again, government-owned park. And they had too many elephants over their carrying capacity in their park. Now, elephants um, eat more than any other animal. They're so heavy, they stomp the ground, they kill the grass, they push over all the trees, they break everything. And so they ruin all the vegetation for everything else that needs it to survive. Um, so when you have too many elephants, <clears throat> you're going to have a problem with all your animals. And so what happened is they decided, no, we're not going to cull any of the excess elephants. And then um, about a decade later, 10,000 elephants died of dehydration, starvation, and constipation because all the food was gone. Everything was to shit. 500 black rhino died because there was no vegetation left for them. So you tell me what's better. You know, you tell me what's better. 10,500 dead animals lying in the bush, or you took off just a few thousand. Yeah, no, and you're or preaching you're, the choir. I get it. I yeah, get it. Yeah. I, and no, I don't I'm know preaching to your you viewers. Can. I'm preaching to your viewers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, and that's that's the thing, right? How do you, you know, that's a that's a black and white to me, right? There, There is no middle ground. We must do this to preserve the species. That's and it? that argument is based on scientific fact and data that we've acquired. We know this based on the, the carrying capacity of the land and the monetary value that we have to put forth to be able to feed these animals. You can only support so many, period. So 
it's not like you can just ship them off. It's like re re you're not going to relocate an elephant, right? You can certainly if you have a big enough checkbook, you can do anything you want, but you can't. Yeah. You can't move five thousand of them right. or five hundred. Like, of them. like there, there really isn't a lot of space left for them, and it's unaffordable. Yeah. It just it's and they're stopped. Elephants are super destructive. They breed like crazy. Um, they, they don't respect a fence. You know, yeah. they'll go through it. And you have to, you know, it's a resource. I look at it at, at it as an elephant is a resource just like every other animal there. And if you treat them like a resource, protect them, but utilize that resource efficiently, you'll have yeah. them for decades to come. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, that, and that's the thing that, that we struggle with. You know, we've got a lot of hunters that, that watch our shows and, and that we communicate with. You know, my goal is to, I think, especially for the podcast series and, and what we're doing is I really like to educate people on hunting and what conservation is. Um, in the States, the, the conservation model looks a little different because we do have a lot more government funding available for programs that you do. Fortunately, we do because bills that were enacted, I think it was the Roseman Pittman Act back in 1937. And I think last year alone, and I'll have to fact check myself on this, but I think that act alone, it placed essentially an act on uh, a, a tariff on uh, shotguns, rifles, pistols, ammo, uh, bow hunting equipment, and hunting gear in general. And it's a small excise tax that you don't even notice at the store. But I think last year that just be from that bill that was enacted in 1937, it contributed $1.8 billion to uh, wildlife conservation. Wow. Um, which is huge. Yeah. And, yeah. And then, you know, with our, with our hunting licenses and our fees and, you know, and I always tell people hunters are the biggest conservationists in the world by far. There's and no room. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. you know, well, you've you have got to, all, you know what I mean? You have to. You've got all these leftist groups with Sierra Club and on and on and on and on and on. And, and they make a show of it, right? They'll, they'll, like Doug said, they'll shake the can, you know, the tins at the malls and <laughs> then they'll go out. Like, with some of them, what do we expect? If they don't even know their gender, like if they, it, how, what, how, how can we help them really? You know, it's like maybe, maybe some of it's just too far gone. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't, I don't understand the mentality to me. It's a, it's an, it's an open and closed book, right? There's, there's no middle ground. There's no toe in the line. It is, or it isn't, you know, like I said, with these groups, they're more, um, they get more excited about uh, a camera crew filming them picking up garbage on a national forest for one day of the year. And okay, we've done our part. We picked up some garbage around this public area where people come in. That's not doing shit for the animals. That, that's just policing up after yourself, what you should have done already. It's your people that are making the fucking mess. Not us. Yeah. Hunters aren't leaving trash in the woods. Something flies out of my truck or I drop something, I'm going back and picking it up. If, if I see garbage when I'm hunting, I pick it up. I want these properties clean, left better than when I started there. That's the way I always approach it. Whether I'm public land hunting, whether I'm hunting my own farm, whether I'm hunting Mike's farm, or whether I'm hunting anywhere in South Africa, leave the property in better shape than it was when you got there. If people would do that, then this would be much easier to get around. And hunters do, though. For the most part, there are some assholes. You know, there, there are some rotten assholes. Everything and in anything in life. There are always bad people in everything and anything. Can't you know. Yeah, and un unfortunately for us in this fight for conservation, it, it only takes one bad apple, right? So you, you can do a million things right and that one thing that that one hunter does bad or the, that one unethical thing that that hunter does, you know, it makes the rest of us look bad. Whereas the, the left, you know, they can all do stupid shit, but it's OK. They're allowed to do that. But if one bad apple does something, you know, then then, oh, hell, you know, all hell's going to break loose because the, these hunters were all ravenous and were bloodthirsty and yeah. we don't give a shit about animals. We just want to squeeze the trigger as much as we possibly can. When in fact it's the opposite, we're the biggest biggest stewards of conservation. Yeah, it's true. Like pretty much every time we, um, you know, we kill an animal um, or hunt an animal, we say something over the animal. Um, I think that's also really important. Is there's there's a very large aspect of respect. Um, so there's a 
I can, I can try to remember it for you, but um, there's an author, his name's Khalil Gibran, and he writes um, a series of books, and one of them is called The Prophet. And he's talking to, he's like a prophet, and he's talking to a village of people, and they're all asking him questions. And they ask him the question, tell us about eating and drinking. <clears throat> and he says, when you kill a beast, <clears throat> sorry, when you kill a beast, Say to him in your heart, for the same hand that slays you, I too am slain, and I too shall be consumed. For the law that delivered you into my hand will deliver me into a mightier hand. For your blood and my blood is naught but the sap that feeds the tree of heaven. And I think that's a very like apt quote. It is all sacrifice, and we will all go back into the you know circle of life. I want to be buried, um, like. Nothing. I don't want to box. I don't want anything. <laughs> All of our viewers just went, holy shit, did she just really say that just on the fly? That's beautiful. <laughs> it's, uh, I said it on the fly because um, it is so like powerful. You know, I just, I've been saying it for years now because it's so true and it's so beautiful. And like, that's one thing I really appreciate about buffalo hunting is like, you dead ass get men who go into the bush and stalk a herd of buffalo and risk being killed. Like, isn't that just like incredible that it's one is going up into the wilderness against the other. And it's, I think it's actually pretty equal chances with the gun and, and the buffalo coming out of nowhere and knocking you out. You know, it's, it's almost like <laughs> a bit of like a rite of passage thing and, and a, I've earned it, you know, because you, you face death. It's, it's quite a beautiful right. thing. Yeah. Well, Mike, Mike uh, we spent, uh, I don't know, seven or eight days. Uh, Mike hunted, uh, we were hunting Buffalo this year, but uh, Mike's a big bow hunter, right? He would, he would sooner hunt with a bow than a rifle any day of the week. So we spent a week tr hunting Buffalo with a bow, um, did, never had a shot opportunity, got close. And I can tell you, I was the backup gun. Um, I was the pH's backup gun. And... <laughs> I don't, I, it's, I was scared shitless that we'd get within 10 yards of these Buffalo and we didn't know they were there, you know, and all of a sudden you just hear the, the, they'd wind us or, you know, they know you're there for whatever reason. They just crash. It doesn't run through trees and shit. I'm like, Oh man, I'm like, this is, and he's on the boat just looking and he's fine. And I'm sitting back here as the backup guy. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? This is nuts. Like you, and this was, we were, it was some really thick, nasty shit we were hunting. And one of those places where you can see, you know, five, maybe five meters ahead of you kind of thing. Oh, my goodness. Nah. And he was, <laughs> he was enjoying though. the hell out of it. I mean, it's got to be just an adrenaline run, a rush from, it's got to be amazing. I've never gone on a buffalo hunt. I really, really, really want to. Um, that's, that's, a, so you got him with the bow? No, I was un unsuccessful, so we come close. I mean, how do you actually kill a buffalo with a bow? Because, I mean, there's just you, you just have so little chance. And, like, if that, if that, well, if that do, doesn't... You just have perfectly... to send it and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I guess that's just life, eh? Cross the fingers and pray. Yeah, right. <laughs> I hope it's going to work. And hope it runs the other way. Did, um, <laughs> did you... I, I think I saw... Uh, Back in March or April or something, did you actually go and did you finish PH school and, and get yeah. your license now? Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so are you, um, are you PH now as a, more of a kind of a permanent thing? Or are you doing more hunts, guided hunts than you did before? I, I know you were already guiding before, but, you know, does this open something else up for you or, you know, it's still yeah. pretty much status quo? No, like it, it does indeed in terms of, the fact that getting um, your professional hunting license, you're able to then apply to be an outfitter. And then I can bring in international um, clients through, you know, my sort of personal capacity through a personal company. Um, and so that's that's sort of the, I don't, I, I don't want to just run around and hunt with people. I want to bring people in and, and organize that all and um, hopefully be at a stage where I need 10 PhDs too. You know, take all these clients out hunting. Um, right. Well, yeah. And that leads cool. that leads me to something else. Um, I'm always taking notes, so you'll have to forgive me. But <laughs> I had a 
we're getting ready to we're, we're going to shoot a podcast here in the next week or so with a group of Americans. And these are Americans that have been to not only South Africa, but the African continent and hunted dozens and dozens and dozens of times. They've been doing it for 30 ish years. Um, and as much as I know about hunting in Africa, you know, their their knowledge is 10x or 20x mine. And, and I, the same thing. Thing keeps coming up about, you know, when we talk about outfitters and vetting outfitters and operations, there's this, and, and I, and I, I knew the practice happened, but they call it the uh, put and take in that there's a lot of these uh, concessions or outfitters. And, and I've seen it firsthand that, that go out with a group of hunters, shoot six sable. And then next week there's another truckload of sable dropped off. Um, so they're, or, or gems buck. And for me, like I said, I've seen it firsthand, um, and I hate it. I, I think it's a horrible practice. So they, it's kind of been in the states now. We kind of call it put and take, and it's not widely known. It's not a widely known practice from from a state side perspective. People going over, they don't understand that a lot of that goes on. But at the end of the day, you can't take fifty sable off a property a year. You also can't run ten people a week every single week of the hunting season on a single yeah. property. No, you can't. Not yeah, I've got stations. Yeah, so to me, that's kind of a, I have a moral problem with it in that these animals are coming off a game stand. Um, now, they could be, you know, that doesn't mean they're not wild, right? So that's the difference between, I think, fair chase, you know, comes in so long as the animal has a chance to escape. It's just the, the you, you can't grow genetics. You can't advance the age class it, with that kind of practice. But at the same time, you're, you're also paying for these big operations. So it's a catch 22, right? Yeah. You, know, like you, I understand. you have to be able to afford your big operations. Now, if you have somebody who owns a game farm, who's, you know, super successful, he has 50 sable in his game farm. He has a hunters coming in. Now remember this is just hunting season, but there's many times in the year where we, lots of farms don't hunt. Um, people are coming in, they take out 50 sable. Great. Now he's got some money from that. He needs more sable. There are more hunters coming in that want sable, and he needs money to be able to maintain his farm. Now, if he, yeah, and especially if he's somebody who has a lot of big animals, then he really needs money to maintain his farm because he has really, really high costs. And those animals need to be sold. That's part of also the culling process, right? But it's not killing them. It's that, that's a guy that's transporting them because he has too many of them. So, yes, it's not exactly nice, but but it also does have a place and it does have a role. Um, you might also find that that guy that owns, that's sending the 50 Sable as a farm far out, knows nothing about hunting, doesn't have a young PH, who doesn't want to be a PH, and so who knows what will happen to those animals. So as long as the animals have enough space they're wild um the you know the hunt is generally still probably going to be a bit challenging um so it's not it's not the best concept it's not great you know um but it does happen and sometimes it does have its place well, realistically, I mean, the only way to combat that, right? And and at the end of the day, this is a this is a dollars and cents thing, and it comes back to the cost associated with with not only main, maintaining but managing the the farms year round, even when it's not hunting season, right? You know, you you still got staff, you still got water, you still got feed, you still got to look after the animals. So you either you get into a position where you've got a very large farm and you're on very strict quota and you say, we're, we can only take three sable this year. We're going to take five black, black wildebeest. We're taking 20 impala, yada, yada, yada. But that's going to limit the amount of hunters that you can run through that place. Exactly. So that amount of hunters based on that quota may not make it beneficial for the outfitter. In fact, he may be backing up and losing money if he does that. So there's, you know, the, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? It's a, it's a practice that definitely goes on, but I don't, you know, for me, and like I said, it, it's come up recently several times and I just, I don't know what the fix is. You know, you can't just say, I'm only going to go to an outfitter that, that only hunts that farm three times a year and there's only going to be 15 people on it. I don't even know if that actually exists, if that farm exists. Yeah. Um, there are some out there, I'm sure, that have very strict quotas, and there's some some government land with with some quota hunts that that outfitters do. I know that goes on, um, but it's just a it's kind of a weird, touchy thing that's just starting to, 
you know, kind of pop up on our side that, like I said, I've been aware of it. I've seen the practice before. It's, um, it's, I've seen it's, the. Well, it's definitely, it's definitely a thing. Um, yeah, it definitely isn't a thing. But also now remember, so you, someone might, I don't know if I should be saying this on camera. Someone might have, uh, someone might have an outfitter, right? Now you're going to your outfitter, you're telling him, I want to shoot a, yeah, 50 inch sable, right? Now, or let's say, let's say now 60 inch sable, you want to go really amazing and shoot a like amazing, amazing guy. There are only so many of those. So you got to go find one and bring it in so your hunter can shoot it. Does that also make sense? So it is a bit, I, I see where you're coming from, 100%. I just am also forced to look at the practicality of it all. Did we lose him? Yes. Yeah, I think we lost Sean. <laughs> no, that's a good answer. Um, yeah. Again, you, you know, you're talking about, you know, one specific animal, like the size wise, right? But if yeah. you more focus on more like a quantity kind of thing. It is you know that's what I think where we're getting into like if you take out if you have twenty sable on your property and you take out fifteen you bring in another twenty and it's like a revolving you know over yeah. and over and over yeah. thing and it's like you know that's but pretty hard it it is pretty hard but again you know is that farmer might need to make more so that he can keep going or right, it's right. Yeah, and and the other farm needs to get rid of them, and but it, but I you know I do understand. I kind of I kind of uh, yeah I have a good understanding of both sides of it. Um, I I had a hunt uh, several years ago now, five or six years ago. I um, I love kudu, which I think everybody that's ever been to to Africa loves loves chasing kudu. I and I've hunted several. I, I think I'm five or six deep uh, between Greater Southerns and Cape Kudu now. And still, every trip, I if I see a big kudu, like it just for whatever reason, it gets me crazy. Um, so I really wanted a 60 inch kudu, and hunted with an outfitter that I hunted with before in Limpopo. And we, I had a kind of a big group with us. And you know, it's not a terribly difficult hunt in Limpopo to to, to shoot up kudu. Um, and that my ph at the time he's like no, no no don't stress you know let's hunt these guys for a couple of days let's you know check the boxes get them taken care of and then we'll we'll go get your kudu and so one morning we get up we have breakfast he's like all right we're gonna go to another farm and, and hunt your kudu today and we we came through the main gate and then drove i don't know a couple of kilometers and we came into another high fenced area well this high fenced area was probably about my guess is 15 hectares maybe and this giant breeder kudu walked right towards the truck and the ph is like hey there's your kudu right there and i'm like uh, -uh i am fucking out there's zero chance i'm shooting that thing he's like well he's probably going to make 63 he's like not on my wall he's not going to you know that's <laughs> yeah. somebody Good else's thing. but i'm that thing's yeah. tame that's a full breeder bull that'll eat out of your hand there's no freaking way i'm shooting that thing you could feed it before you shoot it See, <laughs> right? that's yeah it's a sad 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 to get people in the industry who, who do things like that yeah yeah and it, and it happens and, and i think it continues uh, to happen in some you know what though for some people i think that see it's not the only way they're going to be able to hunt kudu it's the only way that some people could ever shoot a kudu of that that size yeah yeah and you know that's why they call them the gray ghosts because they're not easy to find so right but, but yeah, I, I definitely don't think it's ethical to have an animal in a, you know, 15 hectare camp that you shoot in that camp. I, I don't think that's right. Um, yeah, it needs to be a, it needs to be a good fight. It needs to be a fair fight. Yeah. Well, and then segueing from that, let's, let's talk about the captive red lion thing real quick. Okay, let's go for and, it. Shoot. And... Yeah, so and I'm I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just going to ask you the question. What what's your take on the? You give me your take, and then I'll tell you mine. How about that? Yeah, no, I don't like it at all. I really don't like it. Um, plain and simple, I don't think anything should be canned. Um, yeah, I don't think anything should be bred into captivity to be shot. I don't think that's right. Um, the whole point of hunting is the you know, the air, the bush, the, the fair fight, the, 
you know it's it's even more it's even more than a fair fight because as the hunter you want to be the victorious one right it's a, it's it's more of a it's more, it's more hard um than running away i mean how many times have you lost animals cuz you never see them again often no that's the, I, I would say the majority of your spot and stops are unsuccessful. The vast, and, yeah, that's, and that's the point of it. It's like being a fisherman, right? We could go out and not catch a fish all day, but you, but it, you go and fishing. That's what it's about. Yeah, well, Sorry, my, yeah, my, my the, the buffalo hunt this trip, you know, the buffalo hunt. Like you, you might not shoot anything. It's like going on a game drive on a safari. You might see nothing that day, but boy, is it an amazing day because you're in the bush. Right. That's why it's called hunting, right? Right, not killing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. There's a difference. So much more. Yeah, and I feel strongly about it too. And unfortunately, for once again, I'll go back. That's the only way some people are ever going to be able to kill a lion, right? Is is are in those type of hunts. But then, but I, then like, then they then should they kill a lion? Like, then should they have the ability to kill one? It's like it's like with the buffalo. If the only way you can do it is in a 15-hectare camp, you don't deserve to shoot one. <laughs> no. Well, but, let me, let me ask you both a question real quick. So you're talking about the canned hunts. So let's, I mean, I'm, I'm against it totally, right? I don't, I don't think it should be. But let's say that you have a veteran or somebody in that nature who can't go chase the kudu sides of mountains. Then what's your what's your opinions on that? For me, it's easy. Child or or well, another so person. For me, I think there are exceptions to be made. However, I still don't agree shooting them out of a paddock. If if you are not able to climb the mountain and and hunt, there are accommodations that can be made. And for example, you can hunt off the high rack. And if that's the only way you can do it, at least you're participating in the sport. Yeah. The money you're spending is going back into conservation. The however is, the problem I have is when you get these 20-year-olds that are in shape and have every Absolutely. opportunity in the world to get out there and do it off sticks and do it the right way, who just you know do it off the bonnet or do it off the hydrack, that to me is problematic. Now, there are some types of hunting that are done that way. When you're night hunting these small yeah. little creatures and stuff like that, that's how you cover ground and that's how you hunt, and I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. But to just drive around and, you know, left front or, you know, off the high rack all the time. And I've done it. I absolutely have done it. I'm guilty, yeah, right? I so, I'm, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you early in my career, I absolutely did it. And it was more about it was easy that way. Right. And, and pHs are checking the box. Right. You've got this list of animals. You yeah. want 10 animals and the way to get them in your five day or seven day hunt. You just go out there and you're, you're stacking shit up. Yeah. Um, and that's not even talking about quality. I mean, don't get me into that now because now that I can actually, I understand and I can score pretty much any animal species in South Africa without having a pH next to me and be relatively close. That really changes the game because I have zero tolerance for some of the shit that goes on with, yeah. you know, these guys come in with a big list and then they're just, they're, they're killing the first fucking 14 inch Impala that walks out. And and then and blowing smoke up their client's ass like you just killed a giant. No, you didn't. That's a, a two and a half year old at best. What you just yeah. did. You, that's that's not Everything good. Thing was still on the tip. <laughs> but sorry, Mike. But that, that's and I'm sorry I jumped in there on you. But yes, Mike. That's that's my response to your question there. Yeah. And Sarah, what what, you? what's your Sarah? Oh, it's a it's a difficult question. The difficult question. I, I got to sign it for a package. I'll keep going. I'll be right back. So, in in the podcast you did, the PH journals, you mentioned um, that part of your drive comes from your your father's legacy and his passion. Um, how do you how do those personal elements motivate your your day to day decision making and your long term planning of, of both the the game farm and the hotel? Yeah, no, they motivate everything. Definitely would. Yeah, I think. Um, what he showed me, uh, what he taught me, his love for everything, um, just sort of taught me how to take every day and, you know, be strong through all the hardship. And and then obviously his love for it um, just fuels my passion for it. I also want to make him proud, you know, um, because, yeah, he, he always said that his kids must do more than he did. And that's a really, really big ask. So I got to <laughs> got to make him Big proud. Shit. Yeah, I'm thankful for his his philosophy and for teaching me the things that he did. 
Perfect. Um, and you have you have a younger brother too, correct? I do. I do. City slicker. Yeah. City slicker. Um, <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> so so does he yeah, not, my my yeah. Does does he have anything to do? Does he does he share your passions with the outdoors, or does did he kind of go a different path in life? Yeah. Uh, so he um he works at our our big hotel um in Mulder's Drift. We also have a restaurant called the Carnivore, which is very famous restaurant it's a game meat restaurant it's been around for more than 30 years um and it's the biggest like venison game meat restaurant in south africa and you eat crocodile and ostrich and impala and giraffe and um so he's he's that side working at that hotel um but yeah he he, yeah he's shot a few animals he's but he's he doesn't love the bush let me say it like that um yeah, I can't but, get out of it. Yeah. Not not an anti hunter, just not a definitely not, a not very... an anti hunter. Just I think prefers a more a comfy life. You know, I I have to make sure I don't step on a snake and there isn't a spider or frog in my shoe in the morning, or you know, get the hairy caterpillar off my towel before I wrap it around me after I shower, stuff like that. <laughs> uh, a lot of people are not built for for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I definitely see that in your videos. You're you're tackling snakes all the time and grabbing them, and just uh, like, and and that's me. I am out. If it, a snake, mm-mm, I'm going the other direction. Or you know what I am it is? It's that adrenaline rush, man. Yeah, it's that adrenaline. Uh, those snakes. It's so much fun. It's so there, much fun. Especially I was a python. A, yeah, I saw the one that you you captured and put in the garbage can, and then or the waste bin, and then you you turned it out on the back of the it was the box. Amazing! It was so special, it was so special. I, I would have been standing fifty yards away while that shit was going on. <laughs> They're such nice the snakes. It's not standing. <laughs> the, oh, I am anti I, I, I anti snakes for sure. I was a young kid. I never had problems with snakes growing up. And then years ago in this, and I'm not sure how old you are, but you may or may not have seen this movie. There's a, uh, the, the original Indiana Jones movie that came out. Yeah. First yeah. one. There's a scene where they throw him down into a, um, a, a crypt, uh, filled with, uh, with, with asps and, and vipers. And at the time I was fine with it, you know, with just a movie, I had nightmares for years <laughs> after that. And that just, that, after that, I am a ripper sent out. And and I grew up in South Florida, so everything here is very much similar to the way you grew up. Everything here wants to to bite you, sting you, kill you. To, you so, so as a kid growing up here, you grow up with your head down on the ground watching where you're stepping. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm cognizant of that fact, but I'm the guy that is inevitably I'm going to step on the snake before I see it. And then shit's going sideways then. It was it was a matter of I think it started as it was a matter of there was nobody else to do it you know the snakes had to be caught there was nobody else that was going to do it uh, and that's that like nobody else is going to put down an animal or nobody else is going to so I just had to suck it up and and then I actually ended up quite enjoying it um, and we mostly we get um, Mozambican spitting cobra so that's what we mostly have to catch which that's really exciting because those guys are fast and um but you know if you get bitten by one you're not like really gonna die like you're gonna be hospitalized but like oh that, you know, that like makes it so much chance you're gonna make it no but like i mean the chances are good you're gonna make it like it's not the end of the world you just breathe and take a deep you know smoke a cigarette and it'll be okay um that's that's like, python, that's like saying if you get attacked by an alligator you may lose a limb but you're probably gonna live it's okay you yeah, can just you're probably walk gonna make it animal. you're probably gonna make yeah. it um but the python here we see pythons as blessings so they say that if a pi- if you see a python you you have blessings um i don't know there's something just special about those snakes and they're so calm and so in the past year i think about a year um i've got to see three of them in the wild or well, one of them in my house but so two in the wild, and I had to. I got to touch all three of them, which was really special. It was really cool. Yeah, the yeah. the in my in in my house is where I draw the line. We we had an unfortunate you incident. Had a python in the house too, right? Yeah. Uh, mine was not like it anyway. That thing was it was <laughs> it looked when I stepped on it. It looked way bigger than. So I have a farm in Kentucky, 
And um, it's not my primary residence, but I spend a lot of time there, especially as it starts getting closer to hunting season. And um, Mike and I, uh, we went, uh, no, I think we were working on food plots or doing something. And I hadn't been there in several weeks. So we kind of go and turn all the lights on, get the air conditioning cranked up, kind of do the normal thing. And um, I walked into the utility room to turn on the breakers for the hot water heater. And I stepped on something and looked down and it was a snake inside the house. And instantly, we have to stop laughing at me. This was not funny at the time, by the way. Um, so we have uh, in Kentucky, there's there's essentially two poisonous snakes that you got to worry about. One is a copperhead and the other one is a, uh, a diamondback rattlesnake. Well, this looked to be a copperhead. I swear to God, it was a copperhead. I'd never seen one in the wild. I'd only seen pictures of them. I knew they were there. And I swear to God, I freaked out. Well, right we out of the house. It, it got <laughs> in the utility room and then ended up going in kind of behind a wall and in back in, in behind a shower saw and we couldn't get to it. So I barricaded the door to the to that room shut. Right. I'm like, you know what? We'll deal with it tomorrow. I'll call somebody to come and get it or whatever. And I don't know, it was an hour or two later. We're sitting out in the, the main room of the lodge and I'm standing up. I think Mike's sitting and he's like, hey, he's like, don't freak out. But that snake is right there. I look over and the snake is just slithering across the floor and there's two giant sliding glass doors in the, the front of the lodge. And he just goes right up to the sliding glass door and he kind of gets, and he's trying to go out. So Mike just right, just gently gets up, reaches over, opens the door and the snake goes out. I, uh, uh, mm, pass, <laughs> I'm out. I understand they're out loud, but I do not want one in my house. Period. Uh, I, I get that. If, if it was a, if it was a cobra in the house, maybe I would have got rid of it because, they would get they get comfortable, right? Then that becomes their environment, but not a python like that. That's a special snake. You got to release that snake, especially at that size. I mean, it's got to be a few decades old. It's special. So, yeah, call me a well, sucker. What can I say? Yeah, no, it's in it. Listen, it makes for great content, by the way. I, I think those videos do really right? good. Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that and that kind of leads me into my next question. So you've been really, really good at utilizing social media to not only share insights about the the industry, but really to advert advocate for conservation. And is there a strategy behind that? I mean, your your videos and your TikToks, do you pre plan those or does it is that just shit on the fly like oh, hey, I'm gonna do this right now? It's just shit that happens. I you know, I just, I started and I wanted to g gain traction, but I mostly wanted to gain traction for the hotel to, you know, to get us full and stuff. Um, but then obviously I was just in the bush the whole time and then I thought I'd share it because, you know, um, and it's thankfully people seem to like it. And so not, no, not, not a lot of it is, is sort of planned. Um, it's, as you said, on the fly and just sort of happens. And, you know, unfortunately Lots of disasters happen all the time and lots of, so, you know, like content of getting animals out the dam or stuff like that. But shit does happen. Um, and then the snakes have been an awesome thing that's happened as well. Yeah. People right. like my car, which is great. Um, uh -huh. I'll, I'll but, down in. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's turned more into um, showing people more about, you know, conservation and, and hunting and, and farm life. Um that's yeah. It's it's quite a, quite amazing to see a little bit of growth there. Yeah. It looks to me, you know, looking at it from the outside, that you know, you, you you're getting a lot of traction. You've got a lot of followers now, and like it, your your videos get tons of views, and they're super receptive, and and that's really cool because a lot of like I said, especially from hunting gets a bad rap in general, and our kind of lifestyle gets a bad rap. You yeah. you've taken a little different approach to that, and you've kind of brought the. the uh, humor into it right and it's a different way and it's fun and it's it's you know every outfitter in the world puts these sizzle reels together right where they're you know they're spot and stalking something and then they get the kill shot and then you know the they're, they'll face paint the first timers and you know put the blood on the face everybody does that you just go out and do random funny shit it seems like <laughs> it's, it's more you. like her daily life right yeah um that's what exactly what it do. is you just have to record it yeah exactly that's 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 it but thank you 
Yeah, well, from my perspective, it just looks like, and and I don't think it's for the camera at all. I think you just look like that person that just enjoys getting up every day and going and doing it. Like you're just having a blast and you just, I mean, that's your passion, your drive. And it really, it comes across that way in your videos anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I, I try. It, it is my passion. It's my absolute love. Um, so it, it feels good to know that, you know, I can possibly do some good things for, for this industry, um, for South African animals and show people a different side that, that they didn't know about. And maybe, maybe something that they're more receptive to. Right. Right. Um, well, yeah. And I think it, if, if social, social media is also a double-edged sword, right? It can be your best friend, but it can be your worst enemy because everybody has access to it now. And I, I think if, if people took your approach, you know, to, to kind of what you're doing, it, it paints a much prettier picture around what we do as hunters and conservationists. And, you know, I, I, too many times I think we focus on the, the hunting side of it rather than, than everything else that goes into it, right? It, it's, you know, what I explain to people, you know, when you're hunting and especially that trigger squeeze, that's fleeting, right? That's, that's microseconds. It's Absolutely. everything that la that led up to that that moment in time that that's the real story, right? And, and the yes, years you're of taking care of that animal to get it the way it is to get it shot. You know, you you're looking at fifteen year investment or whatever it is. It's really? yeah. Let me let me if you don't mind if I can ask you a personal question um, from a from a professional hunter perspective. What is so so you you've got a client. Um, you know, you've put in the time, the work, and you you have a successful you know harvest. What is that? What does that feel like as a PH when when you're successful and you see your client like smiles from ear to ear and just you know, ecstatic? And sometimes I know I've seen clients cry and get super emotional. What does that feel yeah, like yeah. as a PH? It it's it's really really fulfilling. Yeah, when when people get emotional, that's. That's when then you feel like you're making a difference because they're starting to understand the circle of life. You know, yeah, it's it feels very good. It feels very, very good. I had a lady come the other day, actually, and it was her first hunt. And she cried before, like, as as her, looking at the animal, her finger was, before it pulled the trigger, there were just tears streaming down her face out of, like, it was adrenaline, but it was, you know exactly what, like, just the deep appreciation for this animal and, and the moment. And it was, it was so extraordinary. Um, yeah. Cause it's real change, you know? Well, and, and I've been on the, yeah, fortunately I've had the opportunity to, to spend so much time in South Africa and, and see the day-to-day -day operation of not only the game farms, but the outfitters and the PHs. And what most people don't realize is that, you know, they get up in the morning, they have breakfast, you know, they go out, they hunt, they come back for, for lunch, they go out, they hunt. That's not even the start or the finish of an outfitter or a professional hunter's day. That's a very small little piece that goes into it. And um, you, I don't think people understand how much preparation that, that you guys do even prior to a hunt, you know, that, you know, in some seeing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's not just the pH. It's also the outfitter. It's, it's the, the, the house staff, it's the cooks, oh, it's the skinner, it's the trackers, it's everybody. 100%. It's the family. Yeah. It's a big group effort that goes into it. And I think most people, and I don't know if that's just, you know, historically how it's been, but most people don't get to see that side of it. Um, and I don't know if, if you handle your operation different, but I know most of the places that, that we've hunted uh, now, <clears throat> I'll preface this with, I've, I've built relationships, my outfitters are friends, I have a PH that I swear to God, I only ever want to hunt with him for the rest of my life kind of thing, because we were essentially like brothers, uh, you know, I, I've been his how to, I've met his mom and dad, I've stayed there, he comes to the state, he stayed with me, and it just, I just, I feel like he's a brother, so we've got that relationship, so I'm fortunate in that, uh, to gain, gain lots of additional insight into the industry that most people don't get to see, but from a, you know, a first-timer's perspective, yeah, I mean, you may see the skin and shed a little bit and, you know, you may, you're going to see your trackers and skinners and a little bit of stuff, but I don't think people understand what actually goes into it. Mm -mm. That, mm -mm. You know, let so alone shooting a big animal like a giraffe, then your, your men are, you know, work to the, you know, the shamu. you got to skin it for like four hours and chop it up in the bush before you bring it back. 
It's a yeah. lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. So before, and I've got just a couple quick things, but I, I really wanted to give you the the opportunity. Um, do you have Do you have something you want to talk to us about? Is there something you've got on your mind, or something that really that irks you? Just let's have at it. What's on Sarah's mind? What does Sarah want to talk about? Um. Well, I guess Sarah's Sarah's. Uh, I think you guys have covered everything pretty well. Um, with with your questions. Uh. Yeah, I think I think you guys have, have done a good job in in prepping me with good things to talk about. <laughs> well, all right, and I'll I'll kind of we'll we'll close with with this. So, um, aside from obviously your your passion for conservation and hospitality, you know you you've got the hotel and you've got the game farm. Do you have any passions or hobbies outside of that, or is that a hundred percent of Sarah's world? Um. Yeah, no, that's my world, eh? Oh, that's my world. Uh, like that, I think there was a work-life balance uh, question. That doesn't exist. <laughs> that's not real. Um, hopefully, maybe one day it could be. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think when you own, when you have a business, um, you constantly have to think about it, and nothing runs perfectly all the time. You've got to be in there, and you've got to see what's happening, and um, like that's just a it's a role and responsibility that you have to take on. Uh, when I do enjoy myself is when I go to animal auctions. Then I enjoy myself. Like like you you were just saying um, earlier, if you can't hunt and fish, you're going to go to the casino. Same principle. I mean, there's there's nothing as close to a casino as an animal auction because that's all bets. You're just going to hope that thing survives and you. Um, so it's that's a lot of fun. That's really the only fun I have. Then I go auction parties and enjoy the auction and but um no you know i love to fish i don't know when the last time i was able to fish is but it's also not the season um yeah no and i'm also far away from the town really so um not much to do the farm is in at the hotel it's is it north of pretoria proper yeah okay north do, Northeast, like towards more towards like Louis uh, Louis Freyhart, like, like towards Limpopo. Okay. Well, actually, gotcha. you know, you can go two different ways. But like, do you know where Sun City is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm 20 minutes yeah. from Sun City. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's not terrible. No. Um, and then, so one other thing, I just jotted this down when we were talking, and I know I said we'll close, but um, so. Given you know the opportunity, I wanted to ask you: Can somebody that's that that has maybe always dreamed about going to Africa, and they they want to, they really want to go, but they don't know how to plan, they don't know how to pick an outfitter, um, they don't know what to expect. What advice would you give them? And I'm talking about from a from a, a, a an American's perspective, right? That's totally new yeah. to this, that wants to go. What would you suggest to be the best way to go about? you know, researching and, 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 and finally booking that, that trip, whether it's a photographic safari or a hunting safari, doesn't matter. What's yeah. the best way to go on that? You think? Um, well, obviously the best route when you're far away from the actual country that you want to hunt in, you're going to have to scour the internet. So, um, I would do it based off of reviews that are left. Um, so you obviously can check different sources to get different websites, but then you want to probably cross check them with their social media pages and have a look at the reviews. Um, and then of course, like it's, it's probably a good idea for a first timer to email a few outfitters and get feedback from different people, you know, what, even, uh, what the different farms are going to be or the different locations or, um, and then sort of make an informed decision based on that. Yeah. And do you think my process. and, and, how much of the, the decision-making factor do you think is based on cost? A lot, I think. I don't. Uh, depending on, you know, what people can afford, it's going to be based on cost. Yeah. As, uh, that's, that's where I'm at. I think that's definitely where I'm at in that, you know, especially for a first-time, uh, we'll call it hunter coming, uh, cost is a big consideration. So um, I feel, though, that, 
unfortunately, and I know better now that that cost isn't the only thing, you know, to a successful uh, trip. And but some people, that's what they they can afford and they have a budget for that. Unfortunately, I, I see a lot of people get wrapped up with outfitters that are really Absolutely. those give and take. Yeah. And because of that, and it, and it takes them several trips to realize, hey, maybe we back off and, and don't, maybe we don't shoot seven animals. Maybe we have four animals on our list and we're really going for the experience and something different. And, but I think it's hard to get a first time person to, to, to come and that, you know, we took, I think we did, what did we do? Three different segments this year, four different segments staffing with different groups. Yeah, I think so. And, and I know on the first group we had, uh, we had 10 hunters and we had, uh, three, uh, three, three camera crew plus Mike and I, and I think out of those 10, six of them were first timers to South Africa. Wow. Um, and, and, and two of them had very, very tight budgets, which, which we were, we were able to make happen. Um, yeah. but you know, but somebody coming over that doesn't have a, a Sean or a Mike or, you know, a Sarah, it's difficult, right? Because there's so much. I always go back to the reference thing. You know, yeah, get references. The problem with Absolutely. a reference. The problem I have with a reference is an outfitter is only going to give you the the references that they know are going to talk good about the experience. So, and then if you go to the show stateside, I don't know. You you've been to I think uh, Dallas Dallas Safari Club. Did I see you were yeah, at, yeah, at yeah. Dallas? So you're there. And so you've got SCI and you've got the Harrisburg show and you've got Houston Safari Club and you've got this big show in Salt Lake City. The, the thing that that I try to stress to people is, listen, the, the outfitters that are there, the, the people that are up front and center are there for a reason. They're very good salespeople. Right. So every outfitter that you talk to is is going to talk a good game. And I think, you know, everybody's first one, though, it comes back to everybody's running these show specials. Right. And at the end of the day, a lot of people book because of that. And then, they, you know, they kind of they, they fall into that. Not that that's a bad thing. I feel like if you're coming at all, yeah. if, if you're able to go and you're able to hunt or photograph expire or whatever, though hunting contributes much more to conservation than photo safaris do, monetarily speaking, there's a big there's a big difference in those monies. But just, you know, that that's my take on it. And I, I'm glad you said what you did, because that makes sense in the research part of it. It's just, uh, yeah. you know, I think. To, and we try to do our best to encourage people to come. Um, we did three or four groups this year, and we're, we're already slated for, I think we've got three on the books next year before I can actually start buy hunt. Um, so, and next year we're, oh, it's a big trip with lots of different people. I think there's like, on one leg, there's 12 first timers. And then and then on one of the legs, there are, uh, wow. we're doing it. Wow. And then we're doing, uh, I think the third leg of the trip, That's we're awesome. doing an all- and an all women's trip. Um, so there's there's eight women that we've got going. Only one of them have been there before, which is my girlfriend. Awesome. Yeah, and we've got and we're gonna film it. We're gonna do everything. Our cruise and you know because that goes back to the you know the the women in this industry. Now there's so many people that want to go and experience that. Especially there's women that want to do it, but they're scared to do it on their own or they don't have somebody to, to, to do it with. So we put this together in mind, you know, Hey, let's, let's try to get these, these gals out there and show them that, Hey, you don't, you don't, that, you don't need a man or you don't have to have this or that to go over there. We can get, go over with us. We'll show you a good time. And, you know, aside from the camera crews and the pHs, it's literally just all women at camp period. That's all it's going to be. And just, you know, for seven days, we're going to start them in the Eastern Cape and just let them have at it and see how it goes. And I think it's going to be, I think that's going to be really interesting for the show next yeah. year. Anyway. That's going to be amazing. That's going to be really cool. You when you when you come this side, you must stop by and visit Kida. Yes, absolutely. You, I definitely. You guys have def a, an open invitation. Well, thank you very much. And thank likewise, you. if you get uh, if you come stateside this year, let us know your schedule, yeah. and we'll see if we can meet you in Dallas or SEI or something like that. Thank you. I'd love that. So, what was your thoughts on the states when you came here? How shocked were you? Well, uh, well. She went to school I mean, here, remember? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I like, I was so young when I went to the States the first time. I can't really remember it. So I've been fortunate to go, like, more times than I know kind of thing. Um, my favorite is Alaska because it's <laughs> – You like the that's fish. That's my favorite. Then Texas. <laughs> and um, – but, yeah, uh, beforehand I didn't really have too much of – of a context but when I went when I studied for my four years there 
then I really just saw how, you know, you know exactly what. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I, like, I wouldn't have wanted to stay there, you know, just because of how <laughs> the, people morally. I mean, it's scary where where everything's going to. Did you guys get the vaccine? I did. Mike oh, did not. Sean. Well, here's the thing. For me, my my primary job in life, uh, I own an architecture and engineering firm, and we primarily do high end commercial projects. And no, they, forced, so my, they, they forced you guys, kind of thing. Well, and, and the problem was, and the drum, you, my field crews and I have to be able to visit these sites yeah. in order to, to design them and work. And and Not they, that said, they did that. If you want to continue doing business with us, then you're going to have this bullshit. done. It is. It's 100%. So it's, 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 so, it's so ridiculous. Anyway, I wanted to ask you guys that question. How many times <laughs> did you get COVID, Chuck? Uh, yeah, so that's the other thing. So <laughs> I, I pushed it off as long as I possibly could before I – and so COVID was a thing now for like nine months before I finally did it and just bit the bullet because I had to. And I never got COVID, and then I got the vaccine um, – Two weeks later, I got COVID. I was down for 21 days. Um, ended up getting the booster. Two weeks later, got COVID again. Got rid of it six months later. So I've had COVID four times now. And I'm fully vaccinated, fully boosted, and I've had it four times. So it's a little full shit is what it is. But so is so much that we don't even know about. Hey. Oh, well, it was. it's, a, it's amazing from a from a medical perspective to see that something like COVID, uh, COVID happened and then the flu was eradicated overnight. Yeah. Like magic. Nobody magic. Yeah. Shit. You, you, you've got several hundred thousand people a year in the States alone that die from the flu, but now we didn't have a single death from the flu in, in the U S over a, a two and a half year period. Yeah, of course. Makes sense. Sure. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. Once again, well, they got to have an escape good for some reason. Right. Absolutely. Well, yeah. And unfortunately, that's that's probably why Biden is in office right now. COVID was a real deal changer here. I mean, it really affected the U.S. in a way. Fortunately, I live in a state that my governor saw early on that closing the state down was not the way to go. So we only did, I, I think he, and he didn't shut everything down. There were some mandatory mandates, but I think it only lasted like two weeks. And he said, you know what? The hell with this shit. We're going back to work. Um, unfortunately, most of my clients are in big cities. They're in New York. They're in Chicago. They're in Salt Lake City. They're in L.A. And those cities, they were locked down. Which sucks. Yeah, crazy times, huh? For sure. But listen, thanks for coming on. You yeah, said. thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for liking my work. Um, yes, I appreciate that. Well, yeah, and appreciate what you do because you you do it in a different light. Even you know we've got Andrea tomorrow. She does shit totally different than you do. She focuses almost a hundred percent on the hunting side of it and the, the the in the field the hunting portion where you tackle the conservation issues and you show the other side of the game farm and the management and everything. And I really love the way you do it because it's unique to anybody else that I've seen. I don't know anybody else that's out there, especially in South Africa, that's doing it the way you are. And but it's something to be proud of. I think you're doing a really good job. And you're Thanks. enjoying it. That's the biggest thing. I'm loving it. <laughs> but thank you, guys. Right. It was really nice to meet you. Nice Same to meet here. You. Have a good one. See you later. See you later. Bye-bye.